All right, Isaiah for beginners. This is lesson number seven. Uh, unusual title, Christmas Before Christ. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so this morning I'm going to look at uh, Christ's birth from an Old Testament prophet's uh, point of view. Uh, you know, we usually look at the uh, event of Christ's uh, birth as something that uh, happened in the past. Uh, but for many centuries, the birth of the Messiah was seen as something in the future, something that was to, uh, something that was to come. So let's go back in time and examine what this great event meant for those who saw it as something to hope for somewhere uh, far into the future rather than celebrate it as a past event. And that's why this lesson is called Christmas Before Christ. Uh, well, the Old Testament period that we're going to look at uh, is the time of Isaiah, uh, happens to be the prophet that we're studying. We know that he lived in the uh, seventh century before Christ. And at that time, the uh, nation of uh, Israel uh, was divided into two kingdoms. Uh, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And we know that the United Kingdom under Saul and David and Solomon was split in two after the uh, death of uh, Solomon. Isaiah lived and worked uh, in the Southern Kingdom and he dwelt in the, uh, in the city of Jerusalem. I think we know all of that. Uh, he was from uh, an influential family as well as uh, he was highly uh, educated. Uh, his name meant God is salvation. And he served as the preacher for the royal family throughout the reigns of several kings that we have talked about, including King Uzziah, uh, when he began his ministry, King Jotham, King Ahaz, and then finally King Hezekiah, all kings in the uh, southern kingdom. Now, Isaiah made many prophecies concerning what would happen to Judah, the southern kingdom, within a century's time. And history verifies that all of his prophecies came true exactly as he said they would. Uh, he made other prophecies that spoke of events beyond, uh, say, a hundred years, as well as prophecies uh, that spoke of the, uh, the end of the world. One such prophecy was given as the entire region was going through a severe crisis. When I say one such prophecy, I mean one prophecy uh, dealing with events that would happen uh, within a hundred years or so. Uh, Isaiah had predicted that the northern kingdom would be destroyed and the people taken into captivity. And this took place shortly after, as Assyria came in and conquered the northern kingdom and scattered its people throughout various nations. And that took place in 721 BC. So that was a, a kind of near future prophecy that uh, Isaiah made that came true. In addition uh, to the prophecy about this terrible event, Isaiah also makes another prophecy saying that despite this region's terrible defeat, there would come from it one day, a wonderful savior who would give it honor before the world. And that was a prophecy long into the future. We read about this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So this is a prophecy made beyond a hundred years, actually 700 years into the future. And so for the people of that time, uh, the prophecy foretold not only of destruction, but also of hope that a time of peace and a time of restoration would eventually come. Now, the fortunes of these two kingdoms, you know, the North and the South, they went up and down throughout uh, history. 
The, uh, the northern kingdom was never restored and eventually it became the dwelling place of a, a mixed race of people called the Samaritans who uh, hated and were hated in turn by the Jews of the southern kingdom because they were a mixed, uh, mixed race, partly Jewish, uh, partly of another race, depending on which nation they had been uh, sent off to. The southern kingdom itself was defeated and destroyed and its people were carried off into captivity in Babylon in 587 BC. And they did return 70 years later, a small remnant to rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple, but they never regained the old glory and wealth that they had had under Solomon. All of the prophecies that Isaiah made about their military and their political futures were fulfilled except this one concerning the child that was to be born. You know, the wonderful counselor, that prophecy was not fulfilled. As time went by, those who longed for the Messiah, spoken of by many of the prophets, including Isaiah, looked to this particular prophecy to indicate the great joy experienced when the Messiah would eventually come. And so much of their hope uh, was tied to this particular prophecy. Now, of course, Jesus didn't celebrate Christmas in the Old Testament, but the thought or the anticipation of the birth of the Messiah did bring the Jews joy, uh, like it gives us joy. Uh, for several various uh, reasons that were particular to them. First of all, his birth would signal the end of the reign of Satan here on earth. We read that in chapter 9, 6a. He says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Now the term government refers to empire and shoulders refers to authority. So from the fall of Adam to the birth of Christ, Satan held men prisoners through their ignorance and their fear of death. The Hebrew writer talks about this in Hebrews chapter two, verse 14 and 15. Now with the arrival of Jesus, sin would be atoned for and eternal death would be eliminated. Jesus would bring a new order, a new empire, a new authority on earth to displace the old authority of sin and death. In uh, Matthew 28, 18, it says, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. When he says this to his apostles, he's referring back to the prophecy of Isaiah who spoke of the time when someone would come and all the authority would be given uh, would be given to him. And so this fulfills Isaiah's prophecy concerning the authority or the government resting on his shoulders. The Jews saw this as the hope of being free from human oppressors only. However, Isaiah's words had much uh, wider implication uh, through Jesus. It wasn't simply a political hope, but it was a spiritual hope. Uh, as well. Another reason for their uh, joyful anticipation of the uh, Messiah. Uh, his birth would give man the fullest revelation of God in history. It says in verse 6b, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and uh, Prince, of, uh, Prince of Peace. Now in the Old Testament, your name stood for who you were. It was a mark of individuality. Isaiah confer, uh, confers four names on this person to be born. And each one of the names is used, <clears throat> excuse me, to refer to divinity somewhere else in scripture. Not just ordinary names, not just ordinary compliments, but these names refer to divinity. Another feature of the names was that each one described a way in which the Messiah would reveal his divine nature to mankind. It's interesting to note that Jesus fulfilled each of these names during his ministry. For example, 
wonderful counselor or miraculous advisor. In John chapter 16, 29 and 30, the apostles believed in his divinity because of his teachings. Uh, mighty God, uh, referring to his power. In John chapter three, verse two, uh, powerful signs were seen as a witness of Jesus' divinity. The term eternal father. Isn't it amazing that Isaiah refers to someone yet unborn as eternal? It suggests that the one to be born as a human already existed even as his birth was being uh, predicted. In John 14 uh, verses eight and nine, Jesus says to Philip, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? Here it was the father answering Philip directly, revealing himself as the eternal father, but doing it through Jesus Christ, his son. And then Prince of Peace. Jesus did not come to bring peace you know, between people. He said that there would be wars and rumors of wars until the end of time. He also said that because of him, there would be a conflict between people between families. He said he didn't come to bring peace, he came to bring a sword. And so the person that he brings is, the peace rather that he brings is between God and man, not between man and man. You know, in Luke chapter two, verse 14, where Luke writes, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. This passage here, Luke chapter two, verse 14, is the most misquoted verse uh, ever. Uh, it's not peace between men. You know, people always say, well, you know, peace between men. That's not what the angels were saying. Not peace between men, but peace among the men with whom God is pleased. They will have peace and they will have peace with God. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, in me, you have peace. In the world, you have a tribulation. And so through Jesus, the world finds peace with God. So until the birth of Jesus Christ, the world did not really know God. But Isaiah prophesied that when the child would come, everyone would hear the wisdom of God, the wonderful counselor. Everyone would see the works of God, the mighty God. Everyone would touch the form of God, the eternal Father in Jesus Christ. And everyone would receive the blessing of salvation. The Prince of Peace was bringing peace between God and man. So Isaiah's prophecy foretold of a time when God would be seen even more clearly than through the prophets like himself who predicted his coming. They looked to Jesus' coming or to the coming of Messiah with joy because his birth would mark the time when the kingdom of heaven would be established here on earth. In verse seven, he talks about that. The arrival of a child would be the point in history when the government of God would be established on earth and it would expand until the end of time. Now this prophecy coincides with the prophecy in Daniel. Daniel said in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. So Daniel and Isaiah, you know, talking about the very same thing. So the New Testament reveals that God's government or God's kingdom of which Christ is the head is not a political kingdom, but rather a spiritual kingdom. And that spiritual kingdom is what Isaiah is talking about here. And so at the end of time, all governments, all human systems will fall and the only government, the only system, the only authority that will remain in place will be the kingdom of God with Christ at its head. In Philippians chapter two, verse nine, 
Uh, Paul says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is mighty God, Prince of Peace, wonderful counselor and eternal father. Until the birth of the Messiah spoken by Isaiah, all were denied entry into the kingdom. But with his death and resurrection, Jesus opened wide the doors of the kingdom for all to enter in, just as Isaiah had prophesied. So the point of the lesson here is that there were legitimate reasons to rejoice at the birth of Christ long before any quote Christmas holiday was ever conceived or, or celebrated. Although the anticipation of gift giving and receiving is fun, and there is a spirit of benevolence that exists even in the most cold hearted organizations at, you know, at Christmas time, the true reasons for joy are not found here. The true reasons have nothing to do with money or traditions. They are quite biblical in nature. His birth is a cause of joy because as Isaiah puts it, his birth signaled the end of the old regime of sin and death and the beginning of the new authority dealing with people through grace and love, not law and perfectionism. His birth opened our eyes to see God in a way that we would never see him before. God is now merciful father and not angry judge. And his birth brought the glorious kingdom of heaven to earth and opened the door for all those who believed and are baptized to enter in, not just for a special culture or for a special rank or gender, but all are welcome to enter in uh, to the kingdom uh, of God on earth. You know, I, I feel sorry for uh, people who celebrate Christmas, for example, uh, in ignorance of the facts that I've presented here this morning. All they have to show for their Christmas are a few toys and a couple of extra pounds maybe and some uh, credit card debt. I do feel happy, however, that every year I can extend to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, an invitation to rejoice at the birth of Christ, no matter how you choose to recognize this biblical fact. Remember, that your joy throughout the year is based on the fact that you possess eternal life and you have knowledge of the true God and you are members of his glorious kingdom, which is the church. And so I praise God for sending his son to be born as a man and bless us with such rich and wonderful gifts every day. And of course, not just at Christmas time, he is the wonderful counselor and the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. He is all of those things to us every single day. Well, that's our lesson for this morning on Isaiah, Christmas Before Christ. We're going to continue in our series. I think in the next lesson, we're going to be talking about the suffering servant, one of the more, one of the more famous passages in the book of Isaiah. We'll see you next time. All right, thank you for your attention.